Welcome to the Lords and Heroes section of my Warriors of Chaos guide. In this section, I'll be going over every single one of the Chaos Lords and Heroes and cover their uses in campaign and battle, as well as abilities and unique effects. Disclaimer. This guide is based on my personal experiences and opinions and is by no means the definitive way to play the game in Mortal Empires. If you have a different strategy or want to add something to mine, please leave a comment down below. Now that's out of the way, let's get into the video. But first, I'm here to tell you about the sponsor of today's video, Audible. Now if you've been living under a rock, you may be wondering what is Audible, and I'll tell you. Audible is basically a service for people that like books but don't really have the time to read, so instead they get other people to read them and then they listen. And I know you may be wondering, well, what kind of books they do, and the truth is, pretty much every single book ever that you could ever think of. They have the largest selection of audio books, audio shows and audio dramas in the entire world. So even if you're a very picky person, there is bound to be something you can enjoy in the entire library. These books are also read by some of the most fantastic voices on earth. Voices like my personal favorite Stephen Fry, voices like Morgan Freeman, voices like Jeremy Irons. These are some classic dudes. They are great. Now, before I get too excited, I'm just gonna let you know how Audible actually works. So there's a subscription service and each month you get one credit, which equates to one book per month. You buy that book, you listen to it, it's fantastic. But it's not just that. When you have a subscription, you also gain access to the massive library of audio shows and audio dramas, completely free of charge. You don't need to buy another credit to unlock them. They're just all there as soon as your membership starts, which is pretty fantastic. You may be wondering, well, I don't have a very good internet connection where I work and I don't want to use all my data reading books. Audible has you covered. There's a handy little app for your phone. You just download the books, listen to them offline, literally any way you want. That app even comes with its own driving mode, so it's easy to control when you're on the move. Now you may be wondering, well, what if I get a book and I don't really like it? Audible has you covered yet again. Members get to return their books in exchange for a credit, no questions asked. And if you've read the entire book and can decide, you know, that wasn't really for me, you just give them the book back, they give you your credit back, and you can spend it on any other book in the entire library. No limitations, they really care about their members. Another thing you may be wondering is, well, I just want to try out a book and I don't really want to commit to the entire program. What will happen if I don't listen to it before the end of the month? You get to keep these books forever, even if you cancel your membership. So you could start a membership, get a book, cancel it and listen to that book over and over again until the end of time and the world collapses and you will still have access to that book. It's pretty fantastic. No strings attached. They will let you keep it. You may also be thinking, well, I'm going to get through more than one book a month. So what do I do then? Don't worry. Members are also able to purchase more credits to purchase more books. And these credits are a lot cheaper than if you were to buy the books outright for an overall membership. Now, if you want my personal recommendation on a good book to start off on, the first one that I'd ever recommended was Mythos by Stephen Fry. His second book to come out is called Heroes. And instead of being about the Greek gods, it's all about the Greek heroes. So, you know, Hercules, Oipidus, and all the other ones I can't really pronounce. And you may be thinking that doesn't sound particularly interesting. Just you wait. If you know anything about Stephen Fry, you know it's a funny guy and he's also really, really, really smart. So he kind of melds it together in this really easy to digest package where it's really entertaining and engaging and also interesting and you learn quite a lot. You learn all about the greatest feats of these fantastic ancient world heroes all the while Stephen Fry is cracking jokes and it is genuinely funny and genuinely interesting. It is such a great lesson, I can't recommend it enough. But even if that isn't for you, as I said, it is literally the largest selection of audio books in the entire world that has got to be something for you on there. So take a look and you will find something, I'm sure of it. So for you my friends, I have two deals. A free month's trial, so that means you go on, pay nothing, Get one book for free, and as I said, you can cancel the membership as soon as you got that book and keep it forever. If you decide that you like the membership, then you might want to stick around for this second deal. And that deal is this, 50% off your first three months of a subscription. So you can get the free trial, immediately cancel it, and then if you decide, you know what, I'm kind of liking this, I kind of want a full membership so I can continue to listen to this every single month, then what do you do there? You come over and you get 50% off your first three months. So instead of paying $7.99, you pay $3.99. And after those three months, it does revert back to a $7.99 cycle. The same thing with the three month trial. If you don't stop it, it will go into the $7.99 payment cycle. So just be careful there. But yes, those are the two deals I have for you. The links are in the description. So if you want to click those, it really does help me out a lot. And I'm sure that you will find something that you enjoy because I definitely have. But yes, now I will resume back to the video. The main thing I noticed while playing Chaos was their legendary lords are all super strong in battle. Obviously Kolek was always going to be a monster in a fight, but also Archeon and even Siggy surprised me with their ability to tear up enemy lines and contribute a massive amount to the outcome of the battle right from the get-go. One area where the legendaries are lacking however are their mounting options. Archeon has a single mount and that's it for all of them. I know as much as I want Kolek to ride in a massive dragon it'll never happen, but surely Siggy could have had a cursed unicorn or something fun to charge into battle with rather than him being limited to a mere footlord. Having no mount on a footlord makes him very immobile and easy to knock around, so it'd be nice to see him get something, even if it wasn't completely within the law. On the other hand, the mounts for the non-legendary lords and even heroes are all pretty decent. 
Everyone has access to two horses and a manticore, which makes for some good variety and damage, and lords all have access to chaos dragons which are obviously pretty damn top tier and worth getting on every guy you can. Unfortunately though, any lords that aren't legendaries felt a bit lacklustre. As I keep saying, chaos haven't been touched by CA in years, so their lords are really bare bones with no really interesting skills or mechanics that makes them unique. The chaos lords are just fighters and the casters are just casters. It'd be nice to see some more variety, like some heavily corrupted chaos spawn lords, in the same vein as Strigoi Ghoul Kings. Again, I'm no lore expert, but I think it'd be pretty cool to see. On the topic of casters, while the lords chaos have access to are pretty good, there's zero variety between the lords and heroes, and I found myself spamming the same army combinations pretty much all the time because there was no reason not to. Firecasters will always be the best, and I'm not going to bring two of them, so give me some variety, and maybe I can think of some more varied and interesting combos. The hero selection, on the whole, I found was quite dull. Yes, the firecasters are fine, but they are just casters, with pretty much no other uses aside from that until they get onto the manticore, and even then they aren't incredible. Even the exalted heroes aren't fantastic in battle, and need a lot of help to even survive. It just feels like a faction like Chaos would have a lot more variety, especially in the form of some very interesting single entity units. The Exalted Heroes do get a mild pass however due to their multi-class role as campaign assassins and battle brawlers, depending on how you build them you can end up with two of the same heroes being used completely differently, but to be honest once you get them to level 20 you end up taking a bunch of both lines of skills anyway so it doesn't make too much difference. Finally one thing that was good as Chaos was the missions, each one I did I completed with relative ease especially once I got further into the campaign, I never failed once I started one and ended up completing every single mission for all of the legendary lords which never happens. If you're thinking of giving Chaos a go, these missions are a great way to break up the monotony of harassing the Empire whilst also getting your guys some sweet loot. Now, let's get into the Lords. At the time of recording, the Warriors of Chaos have access to three legendary Lords but only one faction. This means no matter who you pick, you will start in the same place, but that doesn't mean they all play exactly the same. First up, we have Archeon the Everchosen. Choosing him grants plus 10 leadership and minus 30 recruitment cost for Chaos Warriors and minus 30 relations with all factions. His personal armor is also granted 5% ward save and plus 50% income from raising settlements, and his starting army gets Chaos Warriors, Chosen with Great Weapons, and Chaos Warriors with Halberds. In battle, Archeon is a spellcaster as well as a melee expert, with great armor and armor piercing damage. He can do pretty well in duels as well as tearing up the enemy front lines and eventually back lines, so there isn't really a bad way to use him. He has access to Law of Fire, meaning he can tear up the front lines with his sword and his massive fiery summons, and he has access to just one mount, Dorgar. Finally, he has the abilities Kindle Flame, Foe Seeker, and Stand or Die. When levelling him, you're going to want to start at Root Marcher and work your way through the blue tree, focusing on Ruination, Tribes of Chaos, and Despoilers. Once you can, you want to grab Unholy Resilience and Lightning Strike, which is more essential than ever due to, you know, the Empire. Since he has access to Lore of Fire, you of course want to grab as many spells as you can as quickly as possible, as they will win you so many battles. Then you can dip into the red tree to pick up some unit improvements. If you want to know which units improve your endgame composition by the way, then you can check out my previous video on the Chaos roster. The Grand Marshal of Chaos Tree has some interesting picks, and his mount is always great to get as soon as you can. Finally, Chosen of the Gods and Hearts of Iron are nice little bonuses for any points left over. Archeon also has access to four missions. The first is for the Eye of Shirian, it pits you against a fairly mixed Chaos Force with lots of Forsaken, a few Hell Cannons and some Chaos Spawn. This isn't too much of a challenge once you get into the mid game, since Forsaken drop off a cliff in terms of effectiveness, and you can take out everything else without too much hassle. The item gain isn't too bad, but also not really anything massively special. It makes Archeon slightly better in combat, and protects his army from heroes. Next he has the Armour of Morkar battle. This one is against a varied Chaos Force of Forsaken and a ton of Chaos Warriors, as well as a bunch of reinforcements. You want to either rush down the enemy and take them to pieces with monsters or artillery, or play it more defensively and let them come to you whilst you wilt them down on the front lines. This shouldn't be too much of a challenge when you have a mid-game army set up, so just wait a little while if you want to walk it. The item gain, again, makes him a little tougher, protects his army from heroes, and also improves his wound recovery time. The Crown of Domination is next up, and it's versus a strong, varied chaos army with lots of monsters and infantry. You want to play this one more defensively and use superior monsters and artillery to take them out whilst your infantry hold the line. If you overcommit in this battle, you'll be quickly overwhelmed, so just be patient. The item gained is really good for some light battle buffs, as well as some campaign improvements. Finally, he has the Slayer of Kings, which is against a balanced enemy force of monsters, infantry, cav and artillery, so you want to play this one quite carefully. I found it best to distract the enemy cav to clear an opening to take out the artillery. Once this was done, it was just a matter of moving in and raining fire on the enemy, whilst my monsters and infantry fought off whatever was left. The item gained is decent for improving his battle prowess, as well as some pretty good campaign buffs. Next we come to Colic Sun Eater. 
Choosing him grants all characters in the faction plus 4 Chaos Corruption and minus 60% recruitment cost for Dragon Ogre units at the cost of minus 20% ambush defense chance. His personal army gets minus 30% upkeep and plus 10 melee attack for Dragon Ogres, and his starting army gets Chaos Warrior Halberds, Chaos Warriors, and Dragon Ogres. In battle, Kolik functions like a larger and more powerful Dragon Ogre Shagoth. He's armoured and deals ungodly amounts of armour piercing damage with a bonus versus large. He also obviously causes terror and is incredible at pretty much anything you need doing in battle, aside from taking on flying units, so just send him anywhere you like and watch him do work. Just one note, he is still a massive target, so make sure you take out any ranged units you can to make sure he doesn't get focused down. He has no spells or mounts, but does have the abilities Foe Seeker, Lord of the Storm, and Stand or Die. When levelling him you want to follow the same blue tree stat as Archeon, then go into the red tree for any unit improvements. The moving mountain line is great and unique to him, so be sure to grab that as soon as you can, and the Lord of the Storm ability is always a good time. Hearts of Iron, Storm Rage, and Aura of Chaos are also great for some final general improvements. Kolek also has access to just one mission, Star Crusher. This one pits you against a medium orc force that gets backed up by a couple of vampiric armies. Don't make the same mistake as me, and be sure to keep your army consolidated and together to avoid them getting swarmed and taken down. If you do that then you should have a much easier time, especially if you have a firecaster by the time you get into this battle. Burning the undead racks up stupid numbers of kills and greatly turns the tide in your favour. Other than that, just be sure to use Colic to focus the enemy lords and you should do just fine. The weapon gained is great for battle improvements as well as a decent increase to casualty replenishment rate. Our final legendary lord is Sigvold the Magnificent, or Siggy as his friends call him. Bring ruin. Choosing him grants the faction plus 20 relations with Norska, plus 15 leadership when fighting men and plus 15 armour for lords and embedded heroes. His army gains plus 3 recruit rank and minus 60% upkeep for marauder units and plus 3 horde growth. His starting army gains a hell cannon, halberds chosen and regular chosen. In battle, Siggy is a melee expert with a specialisation in dueling. He has pretty great armour and decent damage that allows him to win most one on one battles as long as he isn't going against someone that has a mount. This made him into a great little assassin that I could send after enemy footlords and heroes and not really have to worry about him too much. He has no spells or mounts but does have the abilities Foe Seeker, Deadly Onslaught and Stand or Die. When levelling him, you want to follow the usual blue tree start, then go into the red tree for unit improvements. His Ego Maniacal tree is pretty great and Favoured Sun is always a good pick. Finally, Hearts of Iron and Aura of Chaos bring some nice final bonuses to him and the army. He also has access to two missions. First we have Silver Slash, and before I tell you about it, you have to witness the speech that Siggy gives before the battle, as it is the most firebeat to ever come out of the Chaos Wastes. Sickly, sinful spectacles stand, shuffle, shamble and saunter shamelessly in my scandalized sight. I suggest a solution. Surely such sedition should sour and succumb to Sigvold, the salacious, scandalous and sensational servant of Slanesh! Son of Sukabai, scion of sordid acts and slayer of squalid serfs! See how I stroll, stride, swagger and swirl, spin, slash and stab at stupid, senseless scum! Soon they shall swoon, shall seek solace and death from sundry torments wrought on them by my strategic, severing, scintillating shower of shivering strikes! Okay, so the battle itself is against a shedload of Forsaken units along with a couple of chariots and artillery. Again, we want to distract the chariots and take out the artillery and then you pretty much have nothing to worry about seeing as Forsaken at ass once you leave the early game. Taking a mid-game army will make this into a walk, so don't be shy to go in early if you want more of a challenge. The item gained is a strong weapon with great battle buffs and a decent campaign improvement. His other mission is for the Auric Armor. Not really much to say here since it's a fairly straightforward battle versus a reasonable chaos force with some minor reinforcements. Just attack and move your units up steadily to meet the oncoming reinforcements, and as long as you don't let them group up or overwhelm you, it should go just fine. The item gain makes him much tougher as well as granting him regeneration and granting the army hero action resistance. Now we have another lord who I suppose you could consider legendary, but he has some caveats. Sartorial the Everwatcher is a chaos lord who was forgotten in the mists of time, since he used to be only lockable by winning a chaos campaign, but now he's just available from the get go. He is only usable in custom or multiplayer battles as far as I know, but I figured I may as well go over him anyway since he is pretty cool. He's a spellcast lord and while it isn't listed as a specialty, he isn't too awful in combat, mostly due to his large size. He obviously causes terror and is unbreakable, so we'll stick around until the end and cause a bunch of trouble to all units near him. He has access to Lore of Metal and has no mounts, but does have the abilities Metal Shifting, Arcane Conduit and Stand or Die. Now we come to the non-legendary Lord, starting with the humble Chaos Lord. They're armoured and shielded and are melee experts, so belong in the front line supporting their troops in a very lead from the front mentality. 
These guys are pretty basic, so just throw them onto the front lines and try to avoid anything that can focus them down, and they should do just fine. They have no spells, but do have access to four mounts. The Chaos Steed, the Bardard Chaos Steed, the Manticore, and the Chaos Dragon. Obviously, the Dragon is my favourite, but any of them can do their specific jobs well enough. They also have the abilities Foe Seeker, Deadly Onslaught, and Stand or Die. When levelling them, you want to follow the usual blue tree start, and follow that with some red tree. You want to grab the mount of your choice as soon as you can, and the usual Hearts of Iron and Aura of Chaos are always good. Of course, Immortality is as essential as ever, and the yellow tree can be used to make them even better in combat. Our other Chaos Lords are the Chaos Sorcerer Lords, and they're all the same aside from one ability and the spells they can cast, so I'll list them as one. They're all armoured spellcasters, but don't confuse their toughness with fighting ability, since Caster Lords will die very quickly if you send them against anything even remotely tough. Instead, you want to keep them behind the front lines to support your units with as many spells as you can cast. All the Sorcerers have access to the same four mounts as the Chaos Lords, the Chaos Steed, the Bard of Chaos Steed, the Manticore, and the Chaos Dragon. And of course, the Dragon continues to be my favourite. They all also have access to Evasion and Arcane Conduit. The Shadows Caster has access to the Law of Shadows and Smoke and Mirrors. The Metal Caster has access to the Law of Metal and Metal Shifting. The Death Caster has access to the Law of Death and Life Leeching. And finally, the Fire Caster has access to the Law of Fire and Kindle Flame. They all also pretty much level the same. They start with the usual blue tree going into red. You want to grab all the spells you want to use, and this varies between the laws, but you really have to make the choice for yourself as to which ones you need. Of course, you want to grab a mount of your choice once you can, and Hearts of Iron and Aura of Chaos are as useful as always. Finally, Immortality is, as always, an essential pick. Now we come to the heroes, starting with the Exalted Hero. These guys are armoured and shielded, and are basically weak Chaos Lords in terms of their combat prowess. You want to throw them into your front lines and assist them with combat and leadership buffs, but aside from that, there isn't really much to these guys. They have no spells, but do have access to three mounts. The Chaos Steed, the Bardered Chaos Steed, and the Manticore. They also have the abilities Foe Seeker and Deadly Onslaught. On the campaign map, these guys spread negative public order, and, as with all heroes, increase the discoverability of Skaven Undercities, which would be great if you had any settlements, so I'm not really sure what's going on there. They can also assassinate and assault enemy units and garrisons, and, when embedded in an army, they provide training. When levelling them, you want to choose to focus on campaign or battle. Choosing campaign will see you spending most of your points in the blue tree, focusing mainly on specialists and assassinate, as well as assaulting enemy units and garrisons. Aside from that and immortality, there isn't really much else to do. If you decide to level them for battle, you instead want to grab only training from the blue tree and sink the majority of your points into the yellow tree with a whole host of battle improvements. You want to also grab a mount of your choosing, as well as Eye of the Gods and Aura of Chaos. Finally, immortality is as essential as always, since you don't want to lose all those hard-earned levels to some assassin. The other Chaos heroes are the Chaos Sorcerers, and again, they are all the same aside from an ability and the spells they can cast. The story is the same in battle too, they perform like smaller, even weaker Sorcerer Lords, so want to be used in exactly the same way. Keep them at the back and spam as many spells as you can. All four Sorcerers also have access to the same three mounts as the Exalted Hero, the Chaos Steed, the Bardered Chaos Steed, and the Manticore, and they all have the ability Evasion. The Shadows Caster has access to the Law of Shadows and Smoke and Mirrors, the Metal Caster has access to the Law of Metal and Metal Shifting, the Death Caster has access to the Law of Death and Life Leeching, and finally, the Fire Caster has access to the Law of Fire and Kindle Flame. On the campaign map, they all spread chaotic corruption wherever they go, and can steal tech, wound enemy heroes, and block enemy army movement range. And when embedded in an army, they increase the chances of finding items post-battle. When levelling them, you want to grab all the spells you need, which, again, is down to you and what you see fit. Scouting can never be a bad thing to stock up on items for the faction, and amounts of your choosing helps them to be more mobile in battle. Aura of Chaos and Eye of the Gods are as useful as always, and of course, Immortality is a must. That concludes this section of the guide on Chaos Lords and Heroes, and this series of guide on the Warriors of Chaos. Don't forget to vote on the poll for the next race you want me to make a guide for, which is linked in the description. If you enjoyed this video at any point, please do consider leaving it a like, as it really does help out a lot. And if you want to see more of this type of video, maybe click that subscribe button so you stay up to date. After all, it is free. For now though, I've been Colonel Danders, and I'll see you next turn.